and it seems like there's been a trend and it's it's been a, a slow trend that seems to have accelerated where it seems like the the US wants to blame every you know our problems on everyone else I mean that it has the fact that our stock market is going down has nothing to do with the fact that the US stock market is the most overvalued in its history and I'm just wondering if, if you've kind of noticed that and what your thoughts were on that. Well, well, you're correct in, in what in what you're saying about how they say it's China. But now, you know, they, they put added another one to it, and that's oil. Right. So, <laughs> for example, on Tuesday, um, uh, January 27, 2016, the headline in the Wall Street Journal's uh, money and investing section, oil, stocks, marching in lockstep. So now it's not China, now it's oil. So what you have are, they can't seem to add between one and one, you know, that's about as far as they go. So it's either China or oil or China and oil. And what they do to make the case is they'll put a chart to show you how, as oil prices go down, stocks follow them and vice versa. The fact of the matter is, if you lay on just about all the commodities, they're going to show the same thing. It's a commodity slump. It's not about oil and it's not about China. It's about a global economic slowdown. We've never had a recovery. The only thing that's recovered were the equity markets because of quantitative easing, Zero interest rate policy. These are facts. Merger and acquisition activity in 2015 was the highest on record and stock buybacks. That's the, you're borrowing money for nothing. You're one of the big guys. You're a member of the white shoe boy club. You get your dough for free. Go do your deal. That's all this ever was. So you're looking at a global slowdown. As I mentioned, now they're saying oil and stocks are marching in lockstep. Hey, how about laying copper on that one? Hey, what about a little bit of zinc? You got any uh, iron ore? Every commodity. The, the Bloomberg Commodity Index, as we speak, is at 1991 levels. It's a global slowdown, and the criminals, the banksters, don't want people to know what the deal is, so they make up the story. Let's blame it on China. Oh, and by the way, as we're blaming it on China, let's throw some little geopolitics in there so we really can get the people to hate China. Hey, look what they're doing with them islands out there, huh? Building them airstrips. I'll tell you what, folks. Let's do a pivot to Asia. Let's protect the shipping lanes over there in China and keep them free for democracy and our multinationals that run the country. So what they do is they throw a geopolitical element on top of the economic element to really make it stupid and make people have an impression that if it wasn't for somebody else, everything would be just okay. It's never our fault. Nope. Well, and you touched on something, Gerald, that I wanted to ask about, and that's the global economy. And it is collapsing, and some, like myself, would argue – that we've been in a recession for some time, and now we're approaching a depression. And will the Federal Reserve or one of the other too-big-to-jail banks create a scenario that forces the U.S. into a cashless society? And if that happens, what will happen with silver and gold? Well, you know, I don't know. You know, the cashless society is happening in some countries now as we speak, you yes. know. Uh, particularly Sweden and, 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 and those type of countries. And when you, when you look at the realities out there, as I mentioned, it's, it's just one big Ponzi scheme. And I agree with you. We've never gotten out of the recession. I mean, after all, you look at GDP growth. What was it since the panic of 08 around 2%? And now you're looking at the, they're saying that last quarter will probably be around 1%. And then you go global with that. And all you have are things looking worse to terrible. So we don't see any recovery coming out of this at all. And to, to make matters worse in the whole situation is that 
you have this commodity slump that I'm talking about. Layer on top of that, the emerging markets collapsing. And no one's talking about that in the context of when, when you mentioned earlier, Dave, about blaming it on China. Oh, the emerging markets are collapsing because China is having problems. Yes, that's true. This is what we said going back three years ago. When the Americans and Europeans stop buying things, China stops making them. And when China stops yes. making them, all the resource-rich nations stop exporting to them. That's what you have going on. Do you see how do, how do you see this affecting uh, silver and gold going forward, uh, Gerald? Well, look at look at what's happened since the beginning of this year, and you've seen every commodity, as I said, virtually sink into bear territory, along with the equity markets and and currencies. Currencies in the emerging markets are down some 18% just year to date. You're looking at other currencies going from the ruble to the Mexican and Colombian peso to the African rand. Remember, these are all resource-rich nations I'm mentioning. Brazil hitting record lows against the dollar. So what about gold? If you owned rubles, and you were getting 35 to a dollar, now you're getting 86, what would you rather own? Gold or rubles or real or pesos or rand? Again, then you t put a layer on top of that. The only reason the dollar is staying strong is because the other currencies are so weak. Going back to the beginning of the year, the declining currencies and commodity prices and equity markets. This is a fact. It's the worst opening of a new year we had in, 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 the, in America than in, in the history of the Dow. As all you I mentioned the bear markets in, in, in a number of emerging markets. There's a bear market in China, equity market, Japan, France, UK. So now gold gold is about the only thing that's gone up in the new year gold's up about 3.8 percent since the beginning of the year when all else fails in terms of economies gold remains the ultimate safe haven i don't give financial advice i'm only saying it as i see it why would i want to be in currencies including the dollar when all they're doing is printing this digital money backed by nothing and printed on nothing. When I could be in gold, which has for millennia been the ultimate safe haven. And it seems to be running out because all the mines are shutting down. The mines are shutting down. And unlike the other commodities where they'll keep producing the commodity just to ensure that they're getting, um, you know, some money because they're so deep in debt. With gold, it becomes the issue. You're really going to pull this stuff out of the ground when you're selling it for less than it's costing you to, to pull it out? No. No. So what you have in, in the difference is if you have countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia and Iran and others that could mine their, their, their oil relatively cheaply and still sell it, with gold, you're pulling it out, you're selling at a loss. With the other countries, they're not making as much as they used to. That's a big difference. So in the United States and Canada, for example, recounts are, are, are diving because it costs them more to pull it out than to pump it. Than to, to pull it out and pump it than they're making on it. With gold is, am I going to pull it out of the ground and lose money? No, it's like the rig counts. You're not going to pull it out if you're going to lose money pumping it. But the countries that don't lose money pumping it are going to keep pumping it. So the correlation between gold and commodities is very different. You know, Gerald, with something that you just said a couple minutes ago really kind of flipped the switch for me. And that has to do with when you were talking about the ruble dollar exchange rate. And in the context of gold, and, and we see 
how much gold Russia and China have been accumulating. I mean, no one knows how much China's ultimately accumulated over the last couple decades, but we do know that in 2015, they withdrew a record amount from the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and a report just came out yesterday that they imported a record amount from Hong Kong. I mean, they both of these two countries are are accumulating a phenomenal amount of physical gold. And I think a lot of us were kind of thinking it was to prepare for some sort of currency reset. But when you think about it in terms of the way you just stated it, you know, in, the, in terms of the rush, the ruble going down or, or crashing versus the dollar, these countries are buying this gold and accumulating it to protect themselves from the dollar because they can't protect themselves from fiat currencies and, and from the U.S. unleashing its fiat currency on the world. But they can't protect themselves if they, if they accumulate gold. I think that's part of what they're doing. Absolutely. It's the hedge. And, and, that's, and, and again, when you, you also mentioned uh, go around the world in 2015, you know, it, was, it, was a, it, it broke the record beyond 2014 among, among the central banks buying gold. And then take a trip here in the States and in Europe and uh, the States, the purchase of, uh, of uh, uh, bullion and coins, you know, it was up some like 200 percent in the last quarter. And in Europe, the same thing, up about 35 uh, percent. China, I think it was up 70 percent. So the physical demand is very different than how they're speculating on the paper markets. And, of course, the central banks do not want to see gold prices go up because that devalue, it shows the devaluation of their worthless currencies. So on one hand, they're hedging their bets. But on the other hand, they're driving down the value of their currencies because you just heard last week um, at Davos, where the richest people in the world meet, 62 of which have more money than half the world's population combined, according to Oxfam, so I'm not making that number up, you heard this guy Ray Dalio from Bridgewater Associates, one of the richest men in the world among that 62, and biggest hedge funds around, coming out and saying that the central banks needed to do another round of quantitative easing because of the pressures on the equity markets. The very next day, we heard from one of the other attendees at the Davos meeting, Mario Draghi saying that stimulus was on the table and they will do anything they can to uh, any actions that they could take to save the markets, essentially. And then you saw a, a, an immediate reversal in the equity markets. You also saw oil prices shoot up on that statement 48% in two days. The fundamentals of the world economy didn't change. The game is rigged. Just like they rigged the LIBOR rates, uh, the interest rates, and the Forex markets, the currency markets, traded $5.3 trillion a day. You just saw the great rig come out of, uh, out of Davos last week. Was it a coincidence? Or what do you think, the people were sitting around watching Bill Gates and Warren Buffett play bridge? <laughs> I would say probably not. <laughs> I mean, you had the Sheik of Arabies over there. Every the presidents, prime ministers, chancellors, uh, secretaries of this and that, ministers of here and there. You think they're around? You know, it's just uh, well, hey, don't play that card. No, they're doing the deal, man. <laughs> Setting us up. Yep. Knocking out them shorts. Those market shorts. Those market shorts. I want to turn the. Uh turn to the U.S. for just a second, uh, Gerald, and kind of look at something a little bit darker. And with organizations like Black Lives Matter, the situation in Oregon, which is currently escalating, and various other civil and uncivil activities happening around the country, what do the trends tell you will be one of the trigger events that creates a mass uprising and civil unrest in, in the United States? I think you're going to see it kind of like the things that are happening in Flint, Michigan, where the people are being poisoned by the state to save money. Yet we have wars to wage all over the world, of course. You know that. Yes. But no, no money for the, we the people. And Obama dumped them a 
tiny $5 million, called it an emergency rather than a disaster, as people are dying and, 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 and suffering. But, you know, hey, how many drone strikes this week, you know? How many they they cost? But anyway, uh, I think it's going to be economically based, but it may have another trigger point that knocks it off, like a Flint type, type of episode. And in, in terms of Black Lives Matter, you know, I mean, it's people are getting killed white and black right. from the militarized police, you know? And, it, it, and it's, it's bigger than that. And my, matter of fact, when you look at the latest data coming out, when you see the depressionary levels that are going on, suicide rates are skyrocketing. Not suicide rates, excuse me. Uh, deaths from um, drugs overdose are, are skyrocketing, particularly from heroin and um, Oxycontin, those kind of things, among whites. So the depression levels, uh, they, they see no future young people and, and older people that have lost everything and see no, no future ahead of them. So it's a combination of the two. And that's what we see kind of happening. But again, it's very difficult to, to, to pinpoint what it might be. But it might be racially charged but have uh, a severe economic undertone behind it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to... to to imply that it would be a race war at all. I mean, I, I'm just, that's just one of the, one of the larger organizations that's out there that's been very vocal. And now once again, we have the situation that's in Oregon and they were surrounded just yesterday on Tuesday uh, by 200 uh, FBI. And uh, there was a person that was killed. Several people were arrested. I mean, in that situation, people are saying that it could turn into Waco or Ruby Ridge, you know, in a, in a flash. And I was just curious if if you saw if the trends are telling you that that it's going to be more of a violent situation or more of an economic. And you and I think you're alluding to more of an economic um, situation. I mean, there was a there was a Gallup poll that was done not too long ago that that showed, you know, 75 percent of the people that were polled said that government corruption was the number one issue, was the number one problem that our country has right now. I mean, if you've got three out of four people that are being polled that say government corruption is my number one issue, is the number one problem with this country, there's a huge problem. I mean, that's, that's a big deal to me anyway. Oh, it is. You know, one of my sayings is when people lose everything and have nothing left to lose, they lose it. Exactly. And people would care less about the government if everything was going fine. And so what I'm saying is that it could be a racial trigger, but it'll have an economic undertone, a base of it. And that that's the way we see it unfolding. Again, looking what's going on in Flint is a good example of, number one, how the government cares, you know, they could care less about you or anybody else or me, and it's only about money. And then again, let's go to, you know, the whitest of white places, uh, the outskirts of Los Angeles, where they have the, that terrible methane leak. I mean, that's a very exclusive enclave. And people losing their homes. They can't go back home. They can't stop the methane leak. So, what I'm saying is it's a number of different issues. And then look what's going on with the declining oil prices. How many banks are going to go belly up, particularly in the oil-rich areas where they loan so much money during the oil boom? Then let's take a look at the cities that are rich in oil employment and oil development, be it in Texas or Oklahoma, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, and when that starts collapsing. And more businesses go bankrupt. It's a combination, as I see it, as that that could be the, the trigger point. And of course, the only real solution is a uh, a peaceful one. You know, it's it's anybody that has violence on their minds, or you know, you know, it's 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 not going to happen in a positive way. All you have to do is look around the world. Happy days are there in you know, look look, look with Egypt with a military coup. And uh, what's going on there? They just had 
the anniversary of the Arab Spring, and it barely made the news. And uh, they clamped down on everybody, wouldn't allow anybody to protest. So it has to be a peaceful revolution. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be. I mean, it, you know, we're, we're, there are enough smart people in this country that want to have positive change. Yep. Well, as John Lennon said, that, you know, once you turn to violence, then the government has you exactly where they want you. They know exactly what to do with you and how to do with you. But if you are not violent, then they don't know what to do. Because That's right. They have, they have no response. That's right. And he's 100 percent right because they only act in a violent way and are, are, are defenseless when it comes to waging peace. Laughter. <laughs> they don't know what to do with laughter. <laughs> no, no. Boy, what attitudes these guys have to, you know, it took me a lot of years to write this one line. I was not put on this earth to take orders by, begins with an A and. and <laughs> ends with hole at the end. <laughs> you don't put this idea in their head. I had this guy, Ashton Carter. You know, the, the defense secretary, a little boy, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Trump, Clintons, Bushes, Obamas, who put it in their head that they could tell me what to think and what to believe and that I should obey them? What self-respecting human being would look up to these low-life sociopaths and megalomaniacs and psychopaths? So if people just take into account their own courage, dignity, and self-respect, we could have a whole new way, a whole new path, and a future that we deserve rather than the ones being shoved down our throat and up you know what by these criminals and, 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 and murderers. I guess kind of an extension of what, what you just were talking about, Gerald, and it's something that I, I've noticed for a while, quite some time, at least since 2000, probably goes back before that, but our system has been creeping towards <clears throat> a totalitarian governmental system. And I, I was on an interview yesterday where I described it now as, as it's kind of broken out into a jog. And that's, that's part of what this political social correctness crap is all about, where they want to tell you what to say what to think and how to say it. And so I'm just wondering if you, if your, if your trend forecasting is, is looking at, you know, do you see our government eventually becoming completely totalitarianism? And cause I'm not sure anything's going to stop it. It seems to yes, be getting we worse. The, the only way, yes, it is. It has. The only way it's going to change is when, you know, the, the people change it. As someone gave me a wonderful quote. It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. <laughs> this is some guy who gave me that one a while. I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the other one is one man with courage makes a majority. Andrew Jackson. Again, what, what person, what self-respecting person would take orders from these jerks? I use the word jerks. I'd rather use another word. So it's up to us to change it. We can do it. The opportunity for a new third party has never been better. And that's the only way it's going to change. And there's still plenty of time. I began my career running political campaigns in Westchester County at a graduate school. And I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. And I designed and instructed American politics and campaign technology at St. John's University. I know a thing or two about running campaigns. It's plenty of time. In the old days, the real campaign didn't really kick off until after Labor Day. This is just a presidential reality show. It's the prelude. So there's opportunity now, if the right money came behind it and the, and the right will of the people, and you need money, there's no question about it, uh, to, to really change the course. And what Trump has done... And my campaign slogan, by the way, to tell you how I feel about Trump for 2016, is Trump or Clinton, Hitler or Hitlery. <laughs> 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 
So what Trump has done, he showed where the fraud, the whole thing is. Yes. And what a bunch of little lightweights are out there. So that to me is the opportunity, Dave, is to see something new happen. I, I guess, I, Roy, um, I don't know about you. I just have one more quick thing here, and I, I'm not going to hold you to any predictions or anything. I just I know that I get asked this question all the time. I mean, I think we all know that that the stock market's floating on an air of liquidity. The you know the, the bond market interest rates are interest rates are going to skyrocket, which means bonds are going to crash. The stock market needs to crash. The thing of it is, they've been kicking this can down the road for a lot longer than I ever thought they would be able to. How much longer do you think they can keep kicking the can down the road before they just lose complete control out of this? And again, I mean, a lot of people that I talk to who I respect think it can't go on beyond this year. And yet, I mean, I'm not willing to go out there and make that prediction. I'm just curious what your thoughts were on that. Well, we said it would crash. And, and a guy, I've been wrong on this because... They keep making, you know, I thought it would end in 2010. Yeah. I had no idea they'd come up with quantitative easing or zero interest rate policy. And it's brand new. If you're over in Europe, it's negative interest rates, negative bond yields. This, is a, is, this has never happened in the history of the world, part one or part two. You know, so how do I, you know, but it should collapse this year. And now, again, you just saw the market return. The market's return to, to a, a semblance of growth following Draghi's announcement at Davos that they're going to be doing the possibility of more quantitative easing. Oh, and by the way, the Chinese were also at that meeting, and they're hinting the same thing. So if they do that, it will give these money junkies another shot of monetary meth, and it'll keep their game going. But junkies at some point, you know, crap out. Yeah. When is it going to happen? I don't know. But the other thing is why I'm bullish on gold is because with the next run of quantitative easing, that's when gold prices are going to take off. I believe. We can only hope. I mean, gold gold has to perform and do its job at some point. It has to become, it has to return to being the thermometer of health for the economy. And at some point, it's going to it's going to go completely crazy because of these psychopaths, sociopaths, megalomaniacs, as you just said, uh, Gerald, that are running the show. They're all crazy. They're completely out of their mind, and they're trying to take us with it, with them. And gold, once again, it ha it has got to return to doing its job. It just has to. I mean. Economic Mother Nature says it will do its job at some point. Yes. Again, it's been like that for millennia. This is only a short period of time. You know, when, when they've uh, when, when they've when they've held this up uh, and, and not let gold take its natural course. Again, the the commodity markets on, you know, the paper markets and the uh, the the possession taking for possession markets are two different worlds. Exactly. So they could keep rigging it with, you know, short selling and on and on on the commodity end, but they cannot do it on the other end. And it's going to, at some point it's going to fail. And as I say, you know, it, for millennia, gold has been the safe haven. And with geopolitical unrest, socioeconomic unrest, you know, why would I want to be in bitcoins, bucks, rubles, or, or pesos or anything else? So to me, gold is my golden years. I, I don't trade it. I buy it and I hold it. Exactly. And with that, Gerald, it's been a, it's been a real pleasure. Appreciate all your time today. And if you would, you do such a great job of uh, telling people how to find your work. If you would, tell them how to find your work. Trendsresearch.com, trendsresearch.com. We put out the Trends Journal, of course, which is a quarterly magazine. Trends Monthly. It's all you. I mentioned the bear markets in 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 a number of emerging markets. Is bear market in China, equity market, Japan, France, UK. So now, gold. Gold is about the only thing that's gone up in the new year. Gold's up about three point eight percent since the beginning of the year. 
when all else fails in terms of economies, gold remains the ultimate safe haven. I don't give financial advice. I'm only saying it as I see it. Why would I want to be in currencies, including the dollar, when all they're doing is printing this digital money backed by nothing and printed on nothing? When I could be in gold, which has for millennia been the ultimate safe haven. And it seems to be running out because all the mines are shutting down. The mines are shutting down, and unlike the other commodities, where they'll keep producing the commodity just to ensure that they're getting um, you know, some money because they're so deep in debt, with gold it becomes the issue, you're really going to pull this stuff out of the ground when you're selling it for less than it's costing you to, to pull it out? No. No. So what you have... And, and the difference is if you have countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia and Iran and others that could mine their, their, their oil relatively cheaply and still sell it, with gold, you're pulling it out, you're selling it at a loss. With the other countries, they're not making as much as they used to. That's a big difference. So in the United States... Myself would argue that we've been in a recession for some time, and now we're approaching a depression. And will the Federal Reserve or one of the other too big to jail banks create a scenario that forces the U.S. into a cashless society? And if that happens, what will happen with silver and gold? Well, you know, I don't know. You know, the cashless society is happening in some countries now as we speak, yes. you know. Uh, particularly Sweden and, 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 and those type of countries. And when you, when you look at the realities out there, as I mentioned, it, it's just one big Ponzi scheme. And I agree with you, we've never gotten out of the recession. I mean, after all, you look at GDP growth, what was it? Since the panic of 08, around 2%. And now you're looking at the, they're saying that last quarter will probably be around 1%. And then you go global with that. And all you have are things looking worse to terrible. So we don't see any recovery coming out of this at all. And to, to make matters worse in the whole situation is that you have this commodity slump that I'm talking about. Layer on top of that. The emerging markets collapsing and no one's talking about that in the context of when, when you mentioned earlier Dave about blaming it on China oh the emerging markets are collapsing because China is having problems yes that's true this is what we said going back three years ago when the Americans and Europeans stop buying things merger and acquisition activity in 2015 was the highest on record and stock buybacks. That's the you're borrowing money for nothing. You're one of the big guys. You're a member of the White Shoe Boy Club. You get your dough for free. Go do your deal. That's all this ever was. So you're looking at a global slowdown, as I mentioned. Now they're saying oil and stocks are marching in lock, lockstep. Hey, how about laying copper on that one? Hey, what about a little bit of zinc? You got any uh, iron ore? Every commodity. The, the Bloomberg Commodity Index, as we speak, is at 1991 levels. It's a global slowdown, and the criminals, the banksters, don't want people to know what the deal is. So they make up the story. Let's blame it on China. Oh, and by the way, as we're blaming it on China, let's throw some little geopolitics in there so we really can get the people to hate China. Hey, look what they're doing with them islands out there, huh? building them airstrips. I'll tell you what, folks, let's do a pivot to Asia. Let's protect the shipping lanes over there in China and keep them free for democracy and our multinationals that run the country. So what they do is they throw a geopolitical element on top of the economic element to really make it stupid and make people have an impression that if it wasn't for somebody else, everything would be just okay. It's never our fault. Nope.
Well, the, and you touched on something, Gerald, that I wanted to ask about, and that's the global economy. And it is collapsing, and some, like my... Things, China stops making them. And when China stops yes. making them, all the resource-rich nations stop exporting to them. That's what you have going on. Do you see, how do, how do you see this affecting uh, silver and gold going forward, uh, Gerald? Well, look at, look at what's happened since the beginning of this year. And you've seen every commodity, as I said virtually, sink into bare territory along with the equity markets and, and currencies. Currencies in the emerging markets are down some 18% just year to date. You're looking at other currencies going from the ruble to the Mexican and Colombian peso to the African rand. Remember, these are all resource-rich nations I'm mentioning. Brazil hitting record lows against the dollar. So what about gold? If you owned rubles and you were getting 35 to a dollar, now you're getting 86, what would you rather own? Gold or rubles or real or pesos or rand? Again, then you t put a layer on top of that. The only reason the dollar is staying strong is because the other currencies are so weak. Going back to the beginning of the year, the declining currencies and commodity prices and equity markets. This is a fact. It's the worst opening of a new year we had in, 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 the, in America than in, in the history of the Dow. As it seems like there's been a trend, and it's, it's been a, a slow trend that seems to have accelerated where it seems like the, the U.S. wants to blame every, you know, our problems on everyone else. I mean, that it has the fact that our stock market is going down has nothing to do with the fact that the U.S. stock market is the most overvalued in its history. And I'm just wondering if, if you've kind of noticed that and what your thoughts were on that. Well, well, you're correct in, in, what, in what you're saying about how they say it's China. But now, you know, they, they've put, added another one to it, and that's oil. Right. So, for example, on Tuesday, um, uh, January 27, 2016, the headline in the Wall Street Journal's uh, money and investing section, oil, stocks, marching in lockstep. So now it's not China, now it's oil. So what you have are... They can't seem to add between one and one, you know. That's about as far as they go. So it's either China or oil or China and oil. And what they do to make the case is they'll put a chart to show you how, as oil prices go down, stocks follow them and vice versa. The fact of the matter is if you lay on just about all the commodities, they're going to show the same thing. It's a commodity slump. It's not about oil and it's not about China. It's about a global economic slowdown. We've never had a recovery. The only thing that's recovered were the equity markets because of quantitative easing, zero interest rate policy. These are facts.